Bulldogs go top after a win to the Demons. The Blues lose to the Roos. And the Dockers choke on David Mundy's 350th. This, this is, is the, the Drew, Drew Footy Show. show. Hey, long road, took a tumble down this black hole. Stuck in Sunday leap, but I'm on level Hello, you bombs, and welcome back to another episode of the Drew Footy Show. Caden is subbed back in this week after popular demand from two weeks ago. Absolutely banging it. Welcome back, son. It's good to be back, Druzy. I'm really, really pumped to talk some footy after both our sides got beaten on the weekend. Uh, really enthusiastic about this, so happy <laughs> to be here. Make sure you're following the Drew Footy underscore account on Instagram to be involved in the show because we definitely read the questions for topics for every week's episode. Bloke of the week this week. I, I did get some submissions, some funny submissions, but when there's a, a legend of the game, McDonald, that we've got to appreciate, I like, I like to stake their claim on this part of the show. Travis Boak, I'm going to give it to this week. I could have given it to David Mundy, but the Dockers didn't get over the line, so I've given it to <laughs> Travis Boak on game 300. Beat the Pies at Marvel. He had 30 touches. He's 32, captain of the football club. He's been playing at Port Caden since I was five. So he's been there for a while, still playing as good as ever. Absolute champion of the game and a great bloke. Yeah, no, he's a star of the game, Bokey. He's from Torquay. So he uh, played his junior footy down where I played my junior footy. Obviously, our careers took separate directions. But yeah, no, nah, 300th game. They had to get over the line for Bokey. And they did it with ease, Port Adelaide. So they're starting mm. to slowly tick over. I still want to see him beat a top eight, top four side. I know they did beat Sydney, but they got to really stake their claim at this time of the year. But um, yeah, really good effort by them for the great man on Friday night. He's the bloke of the week this week, and we're just going to get straight into that game, McDonald, because that Friday night game was the first of the round. Port always win these games where they're the favourites, it feels like. They, they always show up for the games that they're expected to win, and the, the games they're sort of going to be challenged. They usually fold over in, <laughs> some way through the third quarter, but <laughs> they were good. Houston off the halfback line. I was speaking to the pair, and he was very impressed with him. Carl Amon, I don't know if you saw his goal where he sold two candies. Yes. For Brady. Oh, man, that was wet, and then yep. snapped it from 45. He is one of the best kicks in the competition. That is an elite skill. Collingwood weren't too bad. They, they stuck in the game for a while, and they were always sort of just clawing back in this game. They were having success on the, on the counter, I realised, because... Port pressed quite high up the ground. They have that real like forward pressure. So once Collingwood moved the ball out of the back half pretty quickly, got it over the over the back and put the ball into space for guys like Oliver Henry, who I'm a massive fan on, a fan off. Sorry, um, he's looking really good. He had two goals and 15 touches, but he's looking really good. Bianco's developing really well. I was pretty impressed by Collingwood. Obviously, their season's over, so they're just getting games into their, their young stars. And yeah, I was pretty impressed by the youngsters. What did you make of this game? Yeah, no, the Pies were... They, they weren't too bad. They weren't overly impressive, but they weren't absolutely horrific. But um, yeah, Pendles, he, he's got a crack in his leg. So he's out for the season. Um, it's a slight fracture. He said he's had it in his career before, where it's not sort of snapped, but he can definitely feel that sort of heat down his shin, I believe. The Port Adelaide Footy Club... They've had to get it done in the last couple of weeks. They played the Saints and then the Pies, and they've both been away games. So as much as they do get it done against top eight sides, we've seen this season be really inconsistent with upsets and whatnot, and they seem to get it done when they just basically have to. So fair play to them coming over to Marvel um, for a home game and, yeah, getting the chocolates. But, uh, yeah, the Pies, yeah, the, the kids are developing quite well. It'll be really interesting to see if they take a bit of a step up or down next season. But Port Adelaide are starting to poise themselves for the back end of the year. So we're going to hop into the winners of the week now, McDonald. A couple of weeks ago when you were on the show, we had just watched the Eagles lose to North Melbourne. And I gave West Coast the losers of the week. Now, the North Melbourne faithful weren't happy about that. And I understand that. As a small market <laughs> side, when you lose, when you pip a game against a big side, your team's not focused on. So I apologise. And I'm going to correct that error this week. I'm going to give North Melbourne the winners of the week because they pumped Carlton in a game they were expected to lose. But North are developing very nicely. I've been saying it for weeks. They they play with a great intensity. So they beat West Coast. They beat, or they almost beat the Bombers, pushed them all the way to the line, beat Gold Coast, and now they've beaten Carlton. So they've had a good sort of six-ish weeks. Nick Clark, you have been watching with a close eye, and he kicked seven on a supposedly all-Australian fullback in Weedering. That third quarter was seven goals to nothing, McDonald. That's absolutely embarrassing <laughs> from Carlton. But good on, good on North Melbourne. We're talking about North Melbourne, not Carlton. Taron Thomas was huge as well. Zerha, LDU, and uh, Jai Simpkin as well also racking up the ball. So very promising signs in this rebuild. They're developing nicely, North Melbourne. What do you make of the of the Roos beating the Blues? Yeah, I can't really fathom how they got it done in that sort of emphatic 
uh, fashion. It was crazy. I, I was watching the game, and that third quarter, the Roos kicked a couple, and then they slowly, uh, slowly got into the game, and they, they pinched the lead, and then they just sort of piled on this this just absolute avalanche of snags, and there was nothing Carlton could do about it. And it was, uh, yeah, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't pretty for the Blues fans. The only out I'll give the Blues is I still put them in the young side category, and they still are up and coming as, as much as all the Carlton supporters think that they should be playing finals and whatnot. <laughs> That's just not where they're at. So they are still a pretty young, immature, up-and-coming side, and uh, they've been up for a couple of weeks. They've had a couple of wins in the last few weeks, and they've been in good form over the last month. So it was one of those sort of Saturday Arvo, no one there, young side, <laughs> just doesn't turn up sort of games. Um, yeah. And the Roos are really, really hungry, and, yeah, you've rattled off plenty of names that Roos fans can get excited about, but I think Jaden Stevenson has sort of been yeah, underrated. Yeah, about Steve-O. He, he's been underrated because I was sort of questioning whether he was more than just a sort of forward pocketer that kicks a couple of goals, but he racks up the pill, and he's got this poise that I think the North Melbourne Footy Club need him for. So, yeah, the Roos, massive win, and they're going to be lethal towards the end of the season. They could take a couple more scalps. May get off the bottom of the ladder for the first time this season. Noble did say he's very passionate about getting off the bottom of the ladder so that's a good goal for him to set to just climb one spot up the ladder and put Hawthorne down on the bottom. Well it's not impossible for them to jump Hawks and the Pies. The Pies are thereabouts <laughs> for the bottom of the ladder so it is... That's it, nuts. It, it's heating up all over all over the uh, the ladder. From the top to the bottom, it is on for young and old. North Melbourne have Geelong, Richmond, Sydney, so you don't think they'd get any of those <laughs> in Adelaide last game of the season. So we'll see. We've got a question here about Carlton Kados, and it's from Basketball Aiden 273 and he wants to know, do you think Carlton are heading into another rebuild? Or are they just balls deep in one? Are they just in the, the thick of it, and it's just been a bit too long, a bit too hairy for the Blues? No, nah, yeah. Forever, for as long as I can remember, they've been rebuilding, and yeah, being a Carlton fan at the moment must be dreadful. Yeah, they they've been rebuilding forever. Like when you go back to the Bryce Gibbs days and the Matty Cruisers days, I think people are sort of tied into that rebuild, or not that rebuild, but maybe the Jacob Weedering rebuild. But I sort of go, they've started from Sam Walsh, so they're two years, three years in, um, and it takes a lot longer than that. So if you sort of yeah, cut away from the past history and start it from Sam Walsh, then absolutely they're still in the rebuild. And I think this is just a stagnating sort of year. I, I think it's hard for teams to go from the bottom and shoot all the way up. I think last year gave them a little bit of false hope. There were 16-minute quarters. There was less games. So the younger sides like Gold Coast, Carlton, St Kilda were in games for longer and pinched more games and had really, really good seasons. But when you lengthen the season out and lengthen the games, I think the cream really rises to the top. So they haven't had an absolute howling year, but they sort just sort of stagnated, which has been really frustrated straight really frustrating for their supporters. But I think they're now, uh, like the next preseason, I think from now onwards for the Blues, it's go time. So I, I think they're just sort of on the brink of being the team they think they are. So now I'm going to go to the other winners of the week, McDonald, and at your expense, it's the Western Bulldogs. They've been knocking on the door off the, the top spot. They've been up there temporarily, but they've gone up there now officially beating your boys, jumping you guys on the ladder Saturday night. It was a very wet game. I only watched the first quarter of this, but it was very fiery players jumping into packs, putting their bodies on the line, and it was, yeah, very very intense game. There were huge ramifications in this game. Top spot, premiership contenders. I'm not going to talk too much about it because you're, you're the man, but what did you make of these Bulldogs? Obviously, Bontempelli, massive, he always is. Caleb Daniel had a massive game and no... no Surprise in McRae having a massive game as well. How do the Bulldogs compare from the first time when you played them when you really cancelled them out? They had no answer for you compared to now where they where they sort of seemed like they were in control for the majority of this game. Yeah, this was um, the Bulldogs' big scalp of the year. They've failed against the Sydney Swans um, and they failed against the Cats only just and they probably deserve to win that game if we're going to be honest but this is the one that they needed it was an eight point game and the winner probably sews up the top two spot uh, and the Bulldogs they came out hungry they came out fired up they were a little bit classy to be honest the Bonton Pally was really classy in key moments mm. especially in the slippery wet conditions but it was even. It was even the whole game. And it was sort of the dogs got out to a bit of a 20-point lead in the second term. 
through a, a couple of lapses of just effort from the D's, the, the Bulldogs capitalised. And then from then, it was just cat and mouse. The D's would get back to eight points. The Bulldogs would get it back to 20. The D's would get it to four. The Bulldogs would get it to 15. And it just lived between those sort of two margins. So the D's couldn't quite get back into the contest. But I think if you take that game in isolation, these two teams are absolutely up for it. They are, mm-hmm. like, you're splitting hairs between them. It was a very, very close contest all over the park. I think from a Bulldog point of view, that has sewed their top two credentials up and they won't really be budging from there, whether they finish top or not, because the Cats are looking pretty hot. I'm not entirely sure. Is that the only loss you guys have had to a top eight side? Yeah, yeah, it's the only loss we've had to a top eight side. So I think if you look at this from a Melbourne point of view in isolation, you don't really uh, leave with too much qualms. It was a tight, wet, hard contest all over the ground and the dogs just got the better of us on the day. But when you look at it um, through our, our, our last, our last our few last, weeks, yeah, our last yeah. month or so, um, you go, well, are the D's slipping a little bit? It's just funny. Mm. If we pinch the game against Hawthorne, our last month doesn't look too bad. We've sort of won three of the last four. But yeah, when you drop games against the Hawks and GWS and whatnot, it makes our run look a little bit more disappointing. So, mm-hmm. but I think there are issues there. I don't think it's a case of the Melbourne Footy Club just, um, you know, can't beat bottom four sides. If you can't beat four, bottom four sides, then there are sort of cracks in your game plan. So that yeah. needs to be addressed going into the last four weeks of the season. Now it's time for the losers of the week, McDonald. Are you <laughs> ready? Ready? Mwap, mwap. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to Fremantle this week. And, um, you know, people could have said I, I should have given it to Carlton, but I, I'm going to give it to my boys this week. I've been roasting the Eagles fairly <laughs> quite severely in the last <laughs> month or so. So I think it's fairly only fair that I give quite it... quite severely. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's only fair that I give it to Frio this week because last week against Geelong, we showed up, but we just our skill was all over the place. And I was just like, all right, wet night against one of the most informed teams in the comp. That, that's a write-off. Doesn't matter. In milestone games, like it was David Mundy's 350th game, it's like a, it's disrespectful to not show up with good intensity on games like these. And after the first quarter where we were dominating the clearances, we were clearly implementing our game plan, moving the ball really well, really stopping their avenues to go. And then second quarter, their pressure really picked up. They were pressing us all the way to the to the back pocket and then there was defensive turnovers just mounted the pressure even more but we were we were handling it okay we were getting counter-attack goals we were still in the game only went into halftime a couple points down and then Fife does his shoulder he's out for the season now which is which is great but yeah we go into the change rooms come out at half time and within the first two minutes I was on the stream and I said we look flat we look unmotivated this is going to be a blowout and it was Sydney just showed up just outrun Frio. That was the the annoying part. Just genuinely wanted it more than us. Which is why I'm giving Frio losers of the week this week. Because I don't care if you're lo- dropping games to good sides like Geelong and Sydney. But when you're just genuinely getting outrun by these sides, it's just not on. Um, yeah, not happy at all. But he will get suspended from this game, elbowing Luke Ryan. That was a dirty act, McDonald. I, I wasn't happy with that. I'm a big fan <laughs> of Buddy, but just the old... <laughs> left elbow to the jaw. He left Luke Ryan with a sore jaw. He'll get dropped for that. So, you mm. know, maybe you won't get a thousand goals this year. And serves you right. But yeah, in that second half, we only kicked two goals. <laughs> and they were both from the boot of Adam Chera. So, you know, every Victorian side will be licking their lips at that second half performance. Because he was the only one who really showed up for the Dockers. But um, yeah, Sydney, their class. They're making a premiership tilt this year. And yeah, they're looking real good. Isaac Heaney had five goals, a specky on Luke Ryan. He was magnificent. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just a, just a big L for the Dockers this week, McDonald. Yeah, it was a little bit disappointing. I thought uh, the way the Swans have responded in the last two weeks against GWS, they were down and out by about 35 points, came back and won quite comprehensively. And in the first quarter and a half, I thought the Dockers were really going to uh, give the Swans a real shake-up for that game as well. But the way the Swans responded was premiership like to be fair mm-hmm. um does this put a line through the dockers for this season uh we could still make the eight but we we just can't beat the best sides like it just seems yeah. impossible like we haven't actually given any top eight side other than sydney at home like a good crack like we haven't yeah. pushed a top eight side or a top four side four quarters and been there when the game's on the line we're still just in that stage of our infancy where we we can't yeah 
be there to win games. We'll just, as soon as the pressure mounts, we sort of just give up. And it's just been happening all season. The massive Q clash, McDonald, that was on Saturday. Gold Coast were up in this game quite comfortably. They are, they seem to be very hungry to win this game. Their massive local derby that everyone looks forward to every season. And they, they were up, to be fair to them. They're playing well. Um, they've been in good form in the last month mm. or so, but... Brisbane, with their backs against the wall in the last couple of weeks, dropping two results, needing to get into the top four. If They couldn't let this game slip. And in the second half, they come out. I think they kicked like 13 goals in the second half to one or something like wow. that. Ended up winning by 49 points. No hit would, no worries. Danaher, uh, McCarthy and Cameron all kicking multiple goals each. So it was the result that they needed in the end. Slow start, but they got what they needed. Do you reckon they can make the top four still? I do. I really do. I think it's very, very open. I think the Ds at the minute are vulnerable, so they they could cough up a spot. So I think there's more spots available than just the Port Adelaide one. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, the Brisbane Lions, Port Adelaide, um, I don't know where Sydney is, but I feel like if they can get a bit of a run on, there will be a chance to pinch it. So it's going to make the end of the season very, very interesting for that top four spot. To my disgust, Kados, it seems like the Eagles are back, and we've got a question here from <laughs> HGIPP, HGIP03. He wants to know why the Eagles are back. Now, after the last three weeks, a decent win away from home at Adelaide, and now a win against an informed St. Kilda, would you say that they're, they are back, the West Coast? I think they are back-ish. I think yeah. they are... <laughs> win an elimination final back. I don't think they're uh, make, a make a prelim and give yeah. everyone a bit of a bit of a push back. But I, I think they're playing some good footy and there's no surprise. Obviously they've been stripped with injuries all season and I think three or four weeks ago they got their whole team back and then had one of their worst results. Yeah. But that's because they got their old their whole team back and the chemistry wasn't yeah. there and they're just playing their first couple of games. So now that they've had a couple of games under their belt they are starting to play some good footy. So any team that comes up against them towards the end of this season will be a little bit worried because I think they are starting to play their best footy of the year right now. If they can build on it, if they can build on it uh, towards the end of the season and really start taking scalps, then they are absolutely back in the hunt. But given that they sort of fell over the line against the Saints, I'm not quite sure uh, they're fully back. How, How do you read it? Yeah, I've, I've always seen the West Coast as one of those like Geelong-type sides. Like, you can never write them off. They literally need like three good weeks of footy, and then they're pretty much in premiership contention. Yeah. I'll probably say that just because I prepare myself for the worst. Like, I prepare myself for West Coast to win a flag every year. Yeah. Mark Hutchings was back in for West Coast, and he tagged Jack Steele, kept Jack Steele to 18 touches, which is his, probably his lowest return this season. So mm. that was a big in for them. I thought as soon as Rowan Marshall was out for the Saints that West Coast had this. I thought Nick yeah. Knapp could pretty much dominate the ruck at will, although he didn't win the hitouts. I think Paddy Ryder ended up having more hitouts. And uh, I'd like to see what Saints, fan, Saints fans thought of this game. With Jack Steele tagged, Rowan Marshall, one of their most important players, out to only mm. lose by eight points away in the West. It's not. It's obviously a bad result, but it, it wasn't a terrible performance. They were pushing the issue the whole game. Uh, Big Maxi King had six goals, taking massive marks, so he's starting to really develop and stake his his place in this side as a very, very solid key forward as well. There was an absolute blockbuster Saturday night, McDonald, and no, I'm not talking about <laughs> the Melbourne Bulldogs game. I'm talking about Adelaide versus Hawthorne, of course. This game, I didn't know which way to tip because Hawthorne uh, drew to the Ds last week and Adelaide did all right against West Coast, so didn't know which way to tip, went with Hawthorne, got it wrong. Rory Laird was best on ground with like 36 touches and two goals. Tex kicked four. It's Hawthorne versus Adelaide. Does anyone really care? I don't think so. <laughs> well, Chad Wingard seemed to care. He was absolutely going nuts at uh, Kaczynski. Uh, so he, he was quite passionate. But no, I yeah. honestly forgot that this game ever existed. I did not see any sort of notable highlights. <laughs> I didn't see any sort of hanger that popped up in my news feed. And I sort of woke up and went, oh, geez, well, that, that happened. <laughs> Sunday Ivo footy at the G, the grand final replay. And you wouldn't expect this was a grand final replay with the tail of the tape heading into this game. The wounded Richmond Tigers heading in against the most informed side in the comp, the Geelong Cats. My premiership prediction at the start of the year. And I, that that prediction is looking very good at the moment, Kados. How good do the Cats look at the moment? Yeah, the Cats look really, really good. Uh, I believe they're the best 6-6-6 team ever. 
Uh, once that rule came in, it was sort of like how a team's going to exploit it. And the way you exploit it is you have dominant one-on-one players inside your forward line. And I think the Cats with Rowan, Hawkins, Jeremy Cameron when he's there, they are just... Rudder has been looking really good. He's I'll, been I'll super, super he's solid. He's been real good. Yeah, for sure. But they have genuine one-on-one hard to match up on players. So uh, I think they kicked in the second term five goals with five entries in nine minutes. Mm. And they did the same thing against Port Adelaide on a Thursday night a few weeks ago. And they've done the same thing against a lot of teams. They just get in these bursts. And because you can't put an extra man back with the 666, you can't flood your back line, you can't get extra protection. They just have one-on-one uh, contest and with their midfield just shoveling it out it can become really really dangerous so the cats are looking lethal they must win this flag they simply mm. have to win this flag they have had one of the best lists that i can remember seeing in in my entire life and they just keep adding to it like i go jesus yeah. this, this midfield and list looks pretty good gary Ablett and uh joel Sarwood and dangerfield then gary Ablett drops out and they just add sean higgins isaac smith and jeremy cameron yeah. so if this team <laughs> cannot win a flag then there's something wrong so they're due they're well overdue and it just has to happen this year they're looking as good and as battle hardened as they ever have so the time is now for the cats to pinch another flag i like that i like that a lot we'll talk about richmond in the context of the next game because the next game was essendon versus gws up at metricon stadium and essendon have been in in decent form playing exciting footy but this wasn't essendon's best showing they only kicked 54 points for the game. I think they only kicked one second half goal. They were up in the first half and I thought GWS would come out in that second half because they really needed this win to get their season back on track. It feels like every game this season for GWS has been do or die and they Mm. got the result. So out of those three, those three are probably most likely to make the eight. Essendon, GWS and Richmond. Who do you see getting that last spot? I think a couple of weeks ago I said the Tigers won't make it. I just don't see how... They can make it given their recent form, but they've then got they, Freo this week. Don't forget they, that. that. That'll <laughs> absolutely play them into form, boost the percentage up. That'll be sweet. <laughs> but, but but then they come out and absolutely demolish the Lions. So I think it's crazy to rule out the Tigers. I think it's GWS. I think it's GWS mm. that makes it. I think that's what makes the most sense. The Bombers have been brave all season, but I don't think their finals ready just yet they've overachieved like massively so um, fair play to them for me the tigers don't make it and the giants are in what about you yeah no i think i think you're right well the giants should be a top eight side let's not forget that they yeah. pretty much had this entire list in a grand final a few years ago so they should be there they've dropped yeah. diabolical results this season the quality's there they seem to, to make it click um i don't think they're gonna win the flag this year but they are definitely based on this quality, a top eight side in the comp, so they should be there. We've got quite a lot of questions from Essendon fans in the uh, Insta DM, so I'm just going to read one out for you, McDonald. Mitchie Buttsworth asks, do you boys think it's best that Essendon miss the eight and fight for it better next season? Just a bit of tanking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I suppose, yeah, what, what do you make of Essendon's finals chances this year after the late run that they've had? Because I think overall it's been a it's been a positive season this year for the Bombers. They've had a great season. They've had a really, really good season. Is it better for them to miss the eight? Potentially, because it sort of curves expectations for you next year because I'm not sure it's a meteoric rise I think it could be a year next year and this could come back to haunt me but similar to Carlton's where they're sort of in the same spot Mm. 12 months later because they're still developing if they don't make the finals they don't have expectations to make the finals next year if they don't overachieve a year early there's no real um yeah unrealistic expectations for next season so maybe it is a blessing in disguise to have the great season drop off at the end and then really set yourself for next year with a clean slate but then again to really cap off a year and raise your expectations as a footy club and make finals could be the best thing for them so it's a flip of the coin i think you probably want to make finals i think yeah if they can do it and really set standards for their footy club then that's probably the the way to go about it we are done McDonald True Footy Show episode 20, the 20th edition as well. 20. So nice. Thank you. Special guest on the show again, Katie McDonald. Thanks for coming in. Make sure you go subscribe to Katie McDonald if you're not already. Thanks for coming on, Big Mac Cheese. Thanks for having me, Drew's Daddy D. Uh, no, it was really good. So much fun. Uh, I think it's probably best to keep Jesse in the side. He's definitely got <laughs> a lot more knowledge and, and wits about him, but it's still fun to come and pinch hit every now and again. Maybe you sub me out next week and have the uh, <laughs> the Chaos and Jesse show and yeah, I'll sub on my channel. We've been talking about that, and yeah, uh, yeah it'd, be, it'd be nice. It would be nice. <laughs>
All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Go follow Drew Footy underscore on Instagram. Go sub to Caden, and we will see you in the next video. Take care, you plonkers.